Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series reading, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Without further ado, returning to The Invisible Man, as read by Lord Naren White. He had been charged just as one charges a man at football. The second laborer came round in a circle, stared, and conceiving that Hall had tumbled over of his own accord, turned to resume the pursuit, only to be tripped by the ankle just as Huckster had been. Then, as the first laborer struggled to his feet, he was kicked sideways by a blow that might have felled an ox. As he went down, the rush from the direction of the village, Green came round the corner. The first to appear was the proprietor of the coconut shy, a burly man in a blue jersey. He was astonished to see the lane empty save for the three men sprawling absurdly on the ground. And then something happened to his rearmost foot, and he went headlong and rolled sideways just in time to graze the feet of his brother and partner, following headlong. The two were then kicked, knelt on, fallen over, and cursed by quite a number of overhasty people. Now when Hall and Henfrey and the laborers ran out of the house, Mrs. Hall, who had been disciplined by years of experience, remained in the bar next the till. And suddenly the parlor door was opened, and Mr. Cuss appeared, and without glancing at her rushed at once down the steps toward the corner. Hold him, he cried. Don't, don't let him drop that parcel. He knew nothing of the existence of Marvel, for the invisible man had handed over the books and bundle in the yard. The face of Mr. Cuss was angry and resolute, but his costume was defective, a sort of limp white kilt that could only have passed muster in Greece. Hold him, he bawled. He's got my trousers and every stitch of the Viker's clothes. Tend to him in a minute, he cried to Henfrey as he passed the prostrate huckster, and, coming round the corner to join the tumult, was promptly knocked off his feet into an indecorous sprawl. Somebody in full flight trod heavily on his finger. He yelled, struggled to regain his feet, was knocked again against, and was knocked against and thrown on all fours again, and became aware that he was involved not in a capture, but a rout. Everyone was running back to the village, he rose again and was hit severely behind the ear. He staggered and set off back to the coach and horses forthwith, leaping over the deserted huckster, who was now sitting up on his way. Behind him, as he was halfway up the inn steps, he heard a sudden yell of rage, rising sharply out of the confusion of cries and a sounding smack in someone's face. He recognized the voice as that of the invisible man, and the note was that of a man suddenly infuriated by a painful blow. In another moment, Mr. Cuss was back in the parlor. He's coming back, Bunting, he said, rushing in. Save yourself! Mr. Bunting was standing in the window, engaged in an attempt to clothe himself in the hearth rug and a West Survey Gazette. Who's coming? he said, so startled that his costume narrowly escaped disintegration. Invisible man, said Cuss, and rushed on to the window. We'd better clear out from here. He's fighting mad. Mad! In another moment, he was out in the yard. Good heavens, said Mr. Bunting, hesitating between two horrible alternatives. He heard a frightful struggle in the passage of the inn, and his decision was made. He clambered out of the window, adjusted his costume hastily, and fled up the village as fast as his fat little legs would carry him. From the moment when the invisible man screamed with rage and Mr. Bunting made his memorable flight up the village, it became impossible to give a consecutive account of, the, of affairs in Ipping. Possibly, the invisible man's original intention was simply to cover Marvel's retreat with the clothes and books, but his temper, at no time very good, seems to have gone completely at some chance blow, and forthwith he set to smiting and overthrowing, for the mere satisfaction of hurting. 
You must figure the street full of running figures, of doors slamming and fights for hiding places. You must figure the tumult suddenly striking on the in unstable equilibrium of old Fletcher's planks and two chairs with cataclysmic results. You must figure an appalled couple caught dismally in a swing. And then the whole tumultuous rush has passed and the ipping street with its gods and flags is deserted save for the still raging unseen and littered with cocoa nuts, overthrown canvas screens, and the scattered stock in trade of a sweet stuff stall. Everywhere there is a sound of closing shutters and shoving bolts, and the only visible humanity is an occasional flitting eye under a raised eyebrow in the corner of a window pane. The invisible man amused himself for a little while while breaking all the windows in the coach and horses. And then he thrust a street lamp through the parlor window of Mrs. Gribble. He, it, must have been who cut the telegraph wire to Adderdean just be beyond Higgins' cottage on the Adderdean Road. And after that, as his peculiar qualities allowed, he passed out of human perceptions to all together. And he was neither heard seen nor felt in Ipping any more. He vanished absolutely. But it was the best part of two hours before any human being ventured out again into the desolation of Ipping Street. Chapter 13 Mr. Marvel discusses his resignation. When the dusk was gathering and Ipping was just beginning to peep timorously forth again, Upon the shattered wreckage of its bank holiday, a short, thick-set man in, sabby, in, shabby, in a shabby silk hat was marching painfully through the twilight beyond the beech woods on the road to Bramblehurst. He carried three books bound together by some sort of ornamental elastic ligature and a bundle wrapped in a blue tablecloth. His rubicund face expressed consternation and fatigue. He appeared to be in a spasmodic sort of hurry. He was accompanied by a voice other than his own, and ever and again he winced under the touch of unseen hands. If you give me the slip again, said the voice, if you attempt to give me the slip again. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, that shoulder's a mass of bruise it as, as it is. On my honor, said the voice, I will kill you. I didn't try to give you the slip said Marl, in a voice that was not far remote from tears. I swear I didn't. I didn't know the blessed turning, that was all. How the devil was I to know the blessed turning? As it is, I've been knocked about. You'll get knocked about a great deal more if you don't mind, said the voice, and Mr. Marvel abruptly became silent. He blew out his cheeks and his eyes were eloquent of despair. It's bad enough to let these floundering yokels explode my little secret without your cutting off with my books. It's lucky for some of them they cut and ran when they did. Here am I. No one knew I was invisible. And now what am I to do? What am I to do? asked Marvel, Soto voice. It's all, it's all about. I, it will be in the papers. Everybody will be looking for me. Everybody on their guard. The voice broke off into vivid curses and ceased. The despair of Mr. Marvel's face deepened and his pace slackened. Go on, said the voice. Mr. Marvel's face assumed a grayish tint between the ruddier patches. Don't drop those books, stupid, said the voice, sharply overtaking him. The fact is, said the voice, I shall have to make use of you. You're a poor tool, but I must. I'm a miserable tool, said Marvel. You are, said the voice. I'm the worst possible tool you could have, said Marvel. I'm not strong, he said after a discouraging silence. I'm not over strong, he repeated. No, and my heart's weak. That little business, I pulled it through, of course, but bless you, I could have dropped. Well... I haven't the nerve and strength for the sort of thing you want. I'll stimulate you. I wish you wouldn't. I wouldn't like to mess up your plans, you know. But I might, out of sheer funk and misery. You'd better not, said the voice, with quiet emphasis. 
I wish I were dead, said Marla. It ain't justice, he said. You must admit, it seems to me I've a perfect night. Get on, said the voice. Mr. Marvel mended his pace, and for a time they went in silence again. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.